on that. Um, and so then I'm, what I'm going to do now is, is hand across to our, our speaker and presenter, which is uh, Katie Ridge. Um, so uh, Katie, I'll hand across to yourself um, and you can introduce your, yourself and um, also the, 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 the topic. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, good morning to everybody or indeed good afternoon. Um, and thank you for taking the time out of what I know are, is a busy work period for all of us. Um, and uh, I think we've got a topic today that will be of uh, relevance to all of you because we're going to be talking about employment law updates and how you would plan around compliance. And then also the fact that um, particularly post COVID, we are in an ever changing space when it comes to the world of work. So how we can best prepare in relation to that change. My name is Katie Ridge and I'm the head of employer relations here at Adair Human Resource Management. And uh, we provide a range of services for our clients um, and clearly uh, one aspect of that would be um, keeping our clients updated and prepared in relation to their employment law obligations. So I'll be touching on some of those issues in the presentation this morning. Uh, our agenda is that we're going to, uh, first of all, look at the uh, HR priorities in relation to uh, the latter part of 2022. And to help us do that, we're going to explore some of the metrics. Uh, and happily, we have this information to hand as a consequence of the barometer um, report that we run uh, twice a year. So uh, that helps us to keep our fingers on the pulse in relation to what's changing or indeed staying the same in some instances in the world of work. Always one of the top five agenda items in relation to the world of work are of course the issue of remuneration. So pay and benefits uh, will uh, be a lens that we will apply to the presentation this morning. And then um, in a more concise way, looking at employment law updates, and as I said, how one can be compliant and indeed prepare for what is um, in many instances, um, well flagged changes at this point, some of which have manifested recently and some of which have yet to have a commencement date. So I suppose in our journey this morning, the landmarks, uh, the important issues in view would be the ones I have identified on the slide here. Nobody needs me to refer to the issue of inflation, which is testing all of us across the world uh, presently. And clearly it is a very significant factor when it comes to work uh, the availability of employment, um, the um, ability for employers indeed to attract and retain uh, key personnel. Um, that feeds into uh, those who are looking for employment or indeed thinking about moving on to the next level in their chosen sector. Uh, and what are those employee expectations? And um, definitely a, a feature of the conversations going forward is the little depiction there in relation to ways of working. And while there may have been limited facilitation in terms of ways of working, uh, possibly more embedded in the public sector than the private or not-for-profit sectors, it is clear that, again, a consequence of COVID is that we have embraced new and alternative ways of working. So they definitely form part of the fabric of the analysis of what the world of work looks like uh, in late 2022. And of course, uh, a key factor in any analysis would be the issue of um, employment law. So in our barometer, we were looking at um, 
many uh, of the issues that test and indeed challenge workplaces and employers. And I think it's helpful to set out what we have established um, as part of the barometer in terms of the top uh, HR priorities for 2022. So we can see that um, it's really a bit like a chessboard. These things are features of the world of work, but they go up and down in terms of the perceived relevance and importance of the particular items. So we can certainly see that key for employers in the world of work at this juncture is retention. So we want to get people in, that's number two on the list, and we want to retain them, which is number one on the list. So 52% of the respondents to our barometer benchmarking analysis uh, highlighted that retention of key personnel was number one priority for them in 2022. And literally following it by 1% less is that related factor of employee engagement. I think it's fair to say that if we were having a conversation 18 or 24 months ago, the third feature on the priorities for 2022, which is uh, employee health and well-being, that may well have been on a list, but I would think it wouldn't have featured as the third most important priority for the world of work. Uh, as it does presently in 2022. So again, COVID has definitely imprinted on employers and employees the significance and the relative uh, importance of employee health and well-being. The new ways of working have indeed created new issues, new challenges, opportunities, for performance management. So that uh, featured at number four in relation to the priorities for employers in 2022. So 39% of those surveyed felt that performance management of their personnel uh, was um, just shading behind the top three issues for the organization. So again, performance management is always a key variable in the employer-employee relationship, but it would appear to be on the radar more significantly uh, coming in at the fourth priority, perhaps as a consequence of the change in the ways we work. And then, as I say, how that impacts the um the tools and the wherewithal for line managers to manage their team if they're not going to be on site as they may have been historically. And number five, then we can see is the um, issue of talent acquisition. So we know we're in a very tight labor market and that um, unemployment is at um, one of the lower levels in the last decade. And so uh, everybody is looking for talent and there's only a certain pool available. And so it's become very important for employers to ensure that they are having access to that pool of talent. And then indeed that going back to point number one, that they are in the first instance acquiring talent, but more importantly, that they are in a position to retain the talent that they have uh, expended indeed time and money on acquiring. Now, if we look at some of the metrics, so what are the moving pieces in relation to the world of work? So we know what's important to employers and indeed employees, because we had a look at our top five issues. So uh, a, an important metric that employers have to add into the mix in terms of their plans and indeed their um, uh, programs for 2022 and indeed early 23 is the phenomenon of employee turnover. So we can see that um, it's up marginally from 2021 
and that is that we have a turnover of approximately 18.2% um, apparent for this particular year. Now, we can see clearly uh, a, an historic 8% back in 2020, um, which would be very much out of line with the previous years. And of course, that again is part of the gift that kept on giving COVID and that people were clearly stationary as a consequence of the global pandemic. But it does show us how quickly people um, get back into the swing of uh, contemplating where they want to be in terms of job satisfaction, um, sig significant and um, sufficient and sustainable remuneration, etc. And indeed, that brings me on to um, one of the important findings of our barometer, which was looking at and inquiring around what were the reasons for employees leaving in 2021. So, you know, what is it that drives this 18.2% of workers to look elsewhere in terms of their employment? Well, maybe if we start at the 30%, and that is the better work-life balance. Again, I think it is evident in all analyses of the impacts of COVID that that short, or well, not short, but that sharp shock of COVID got people to maybe contemplate how they were with their work-life balance. Indeed, many of us were so busy with working that it's possibly something that we didn't have a window in terms of uh, reviewing how that was working for us. But clearly people have determined that they want a better work-life balance. And therefore, if they're feeling that that is not something that they are um, having available to them in their present employment, they are looking around. Now, we're always going to get the phenomenon of career progression, and that's a good thing because clearly nothing much happens in organizations that remain stagnant. So it, it's inevitable that persons are going to look in terms of uh, pushing on and getting more rounded in relation to their particular uh, sectoral competencies. So 37% of respondents pointed to that being a significant factor in their ultimate decision to leave their then employment. And we can see then that 56% uh, were looking at the issue of salary. So that's significant because if we look at the reasons in 2020, which is the nearest comparator in respect of salary, we see that nearly half of that amount uh, was the rationale for higher salary and leaving uh, an employment. So only 29% back in 2021 were citing the need for a higher or the desire for a higher salary. Uh, as a rationale for vacating their then employment. Um, so progressing your career, I think, has taken a leap on, understandably. Uh, it was 16% in 2021. We know that people feel that 18 at least months have kind of passed them by and they would have envisaged themselves being further on on their career path had COVID not happened. Uh, but clearly a big issue for employers to factor into their employee at attraction and retention is this issue uh, that employees, 56% of the respondents are citing their need to leave their current employer as being a need to get a higher salary. So what are employers um, advising us that they are using as initiatives in managing these metrics? Well, um, obviously, uh, different sectors have different constraints on them. But generally speaking, 
um, employers in the round were citing that they were enhancing or increasing investment in learning and development. So 23% of employers were citing that as an important um, response, as it were, to uh, the need to deal with this move in uh, the world of work. And of course, um, th that's a, a significant uh, investment that employers are doing in terms of uh, looking at medium and long term uh, development of key personnel in their employment so that they can be of added value going forward. Um, there's no getting away from the uh, need and the articulation by um, competent, attractive workers that they're looking to be paid more. So 31% of respondents have pointed to uh, increasing or contemplating increasing salaries that are on offer in order to attract and retain key personnel. And then we see again the uh, outcome or one of the outcomes of COVID and that is this development over a very short period of time, it has to be said, um, across sectors around um, offers of flexible work arrangements up to and including full remote working. And obviously that is dependent on the task in hand. But it's very clear that um, what was a tiny cohort of worker that worked remotely and for example, remotely in another jurisdiction um, that would have been in, in a handful of cases, in a handful of businesses. We can see that very clearly that has become a new reality in many employments. And obviously, whether there is a hybrid half time working on site and half time remote working or whatever other variant uh, of that arrangement is in place, that's obviously going to be dependent on the nature of the sector in which it applies and on the ask and indeed the response of the relevant employer. But it's certainly significant that over less than a 24 month period, something that arguably may have taken a decade to propose, discuss, trash out and ultimately establish has actually happened in uh, one fifth of the time that would be expected and on a much greater scale also, I think. So the metrics are important and another reason they're important is the uh, bottom line cost to businesses in terms of replacing an employee. So if somebody isn't feeling the love as it were in terms of seeing an increased investment in their learning and development, an increase in their salary, and that there's some sort of consultative dynamic around remote working, then they're probably heading to uh, faraway hills. And if that is their decision, you're looking at an average cost of approximately 7,300 euros to replace an employee. Now, clearly that's scaled, determined by the size of the organization. Uh, and uh, of course, there's also the time that the organization has expended uh, in relation to um, the replacement of the employee. So clearly it's inevitable that employees will move on and that's healthy and normal. But if we're bleeding employees because we're not addressing the variables that are key to uh, prospective talent who are thinking about coming to work in our business or organization, then we really are um, ratcheting up a lot of costs for the organization. So if we turn our attention then to the issue, particularly of pay and benefits. So what did our barometer determine in relation to uh, pay and benefits? So faced with the um, information that the um, attractive, competent worker has an expectation of salaries being enhanced and increased, we found in our barometer 
um, data, which goes back to March of this year, that there was a conversation uh, in the order of about 5.3% being the average salary increase in uh, 2022. And um, then we see that um, there is some um, change in the uh, degree of salary increase that employers were contemplating in November. Now that may speak to the ability of the employer to pay and conflating factors may be the war in Ukraine, the inflation, uh, the costs of uh, particularly draconian costs of uh, utility and energy uh, outgoing. So there's, there's a lot of movable pieces that may have uh, influenced 3.7%. Uh, I also think that one needs to bear in mind that um, the public sector pay deal has uh, been agreed in the region of 6.5%, albeit split between this year and next year. So perhaps that 3.7% is going to go in an upward trajectory again. Um, we'll, we will await developments. As I say, the determinants of the ability uh, or the achievability, indeed, for employees of an enhanced remuneration, uh, the factors that the participants in the barometer cited as being relevant to whether they enhanced salaries were uh, the affordability of the organization. So again, we would expect that to be a key variable the profitability of the organization. Um, the unconditional increases are a sector that clearly have affordability and profitability uh, sorted as it were, and are responding to their absolute need to attract and retain key personnel. Um, in some organizations, a fifth of the respondents said that they were including in the salary increase, the fact that workplace changes had been achieved. And again, that's something that's quite commonplace in terms of any salary enhancements. And touching on my comments earlier, 19% of the respondents said that their decisions in relation to salary increases were linked to external pay scales. So the public sector, or the HSE, or other sectoral agreements. So even in the private sector, it is apparent that uh, employees generally are very well informed in terms of the variables that are out there. So it's important that businesses making decisions around salary enhancements are indeed not enhancing salaries are bringing into that decision all of the variables that will be very easily accessible to people who are currently working in the organization or indeed who are contemplating working in it. So let's turn our attention now to another um, important part of the fabric of the world of work in late 2022. Now there are a number of employment law updates that have manifested and clearly there is a, an important element to this um, in terms of employer awareness and that awareness then allowing the employer to be compliant as they are obliged indeed to be. Um, in no particular order, there has been um, further legislative provision in relation to the Gender Pay Gap Information Act. So, the purpose of this legislation is to have a statutory basis for gender pay gap reporting in Ireland. And I suppose, in summary, the Act is requiring organisations to report on their hourly gender pay gap across a range of metrics. Now, we can see that the, the application to my business, as it were, dates are set out as 2022. So if you have 250 or more employees, then you should presently 
be compliant with the asks of the Gender Pay Gap Information Act. If you have 150, then you have until 2024. And if you are smaller again and have in excess of 50, you have until 2025. And basically the ask of this legislation is that employers produce gender pay gap information within six months of a snapshot date. So what the employer does if they're in the 250 bracket, which means the act is relevant to them now, they determine on the 26th of October that they are going to take this literally snapshot of their gender pay gap circumstance. And um, they must then publish their gender pay gap information six months after the 26th of uh, October, as in the example that I've given. And what is the information in the report that they must provide? Well, they have to give the mean and the median gap in hourly and bonus pay between men and women, and also in terms of temporary male and female employees. They also have to look at the percentage of men and women who receive bonus pay and benefits in kind, and the proportions of male and female employees in the lower, lower middle, upper middle, and upper quartile pay bands. And the employer also has to set out that in their opinion, where there are differences, the reasons for those differences, and if measures are required, they have to indicate what are the measures that they are taking or contemplating taking to eliminate or reduce um, gender pay gap uh, differences. And I suppose the significance of the legislation, apart from all of that, is that this information has to be published on the employer's website or in some other way that is accessible to all employees and indeed to the public. So if you haven't uh, flagged this in your organization as a compliance issue and you have in excess of 250 employees, then that clearly is something that you would need to uh, get under um, fairly immediately. Uh, new codes of practice that we've seen introduced in 2022. So we've had codes of practice in relation to bullying, we've had codes of practice in relation to harassment. This code of practice was introduced by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission in March 22, and it is to do specifically with the phenomenon of harassment and sexual harassment. And again, the key asks compliance wise for employers are that they would appoint a designated person in respect of harassment and sexual harassment. They would have a senior in the organization champion in respect of um, the elimination of these kinds of behaviors. Uh, an investigation will be required um, if matters cannot be resolved um, in an informal way. And the code is um, quite rightly advising that there should be a gender balance in relation to any investigation panel. There should be uh, awareness raising initiatives, training and competent and skilled um, initiatives around particularly line managers who clearly are uh, going to uh, have uh, work when it comes to uh, issues of harassment and sexual harassment allegations. And it also outlines a commitment on behalf of the employer to regularly review the policy and uh, ensure that the competent persons are uh, up to date in terms of their awareness and their training. So again, that may be something that you require to address. Now, the same entity the Human Rights and Equality Commission also in March 22 produced a code of practice in relation to equal pay. So we have um, employment equality legislation that provides for the provision of equal pay on the basis of um, gender. And indeed, where a contract doesn't provide for that as a consequence of our equal pay legislation, it is presumed that there is equal pay in relation to men and women doing the same or indeed like work. And this code is um, 
supporting that phenomenon in terms of its promoting the implementation of procedures um, in workplaces to ensure that persons receive equal pay for like work. And it provides very good guidance in terms of what amounts to the right to equal pay and um, how one goes about the elimination of pay equalities, inequalities rather, and how you go about dispute uh, resolution. Um, and even though we have had legislation since the 1970s in relation to equality of pay and conditions, it is interesting that this is still an area of significant complaint in relation to the Workplace Rate Relations Commission and their annual reports. So this code of practice is certainly uh, helpful in terms of signposting your compliance around equal pay. Now, one that we, I think, are all familiar with because it seems like we've been talking about it for a very long time is the mooted sick statutory sick leave legislation. And the rationale behind the introduction of this legislation is that there was awareness that many organizations did not in fact provide any sick pay um, entitlement for employees. So this act is providing for a scheme whereby sick leave will be available on a certain criterion to employees. <clears throat> and again, legislation is always setting a floor of rights. Uh, and so the basic entitlement that the legislation is contemplating is when the act is commenced in that first year, employees would be entitled to three days paid sick leave. The following year, that would increase to five, the following year to seven, and presently in year four, after the commencement of the legislation, it would amount to 10 days paid sick leave. So obviously the rate of payment is relevant, but 70% of the normal wages up to a maximum of 110 euros per day are what the legislation is providing for. Now I mentioned that it hasn't in fact commenced yet and the mooted effective commencement date is the 1st of January. So again, becoming prepared for this, which is really what 10 or so weeks away, um, would be very important. Now, the asks in terms of the um, utilization of this statutory sick entitlement are that the relevant employee would produce a medical cert and that it wouldn't kick in until a worker was in employment for 13 weeks. Again, as with all employment rights of recent times, we see that the legislation has an anti penalization clause, so nobody should be penalized for exercising their right to avail of statutory sick pay. And there is a right of complaint to the WRC in relation to um, a non payment or a dispute around uh, the payment of a statutory sick pay. Clearly, the employer is um, welcomed to have a more favorable company scheme. But if you don't have a scheme or have a less favorable one, a little bit like the um, interpretation into employment contracts, it will be interpreted that this scheme applies. Uh, there is an exemption from the obligation to pay where you're able to show on objective grounds that you are unable to pay. And there is a requirement also for statutory sick leave to be recorded for a period of four years um, again. And that would be around the issue of data that would be relevant to a complaint should one be made by either the employee or indeed if the employer was trying to defend 
an allegation made under the scheme when it gets up and running. So your uh, for your calendar, uh, that would be the 1st of January 2023, but you should be prepping to have the policy and the practicalities in place in advance of that. Uh, another important development in the world of work is the extension of the protected disclosures legislation. So we had the Protected Disclosures Act of 2014, which in the main was dealing with um, a mandatory provision of protected disclosures uh, rights in the public sector. So consequent on a new directive, Ireland and other member states had to update their protected disclosure uh, rights and some of the key important changes in this 2022 Act are that the definition of a worker for the purposes of a protected disclosure has been broadened significantly. So it would be important that you know that now board members are captured by the definition of worker under the 2022 provision, as indeed are shareholders trainees, applicants for jobs and volunteers. The definition of what is a relevant wrongdoing, which would really be the catalyst for somebody maintaining that they what they needed to make protected disclosure, is also refined. And that definition includes a, a breach, which is defined as an act or an omission that is unlawful and it relates to a range of activities, but uh, clearly some of the key ones, financial services, anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, <coughs> public health and consumer protection. So the scope of an allegation of relevant wrongdoing has uh, been considerably extended as indeed has the scope of the persons who are protected under that umbrella term worker. Now, in terms of compliance, employees with between uh, 50 and 250 employees as part of this amending legislation are obligated to establish internal reporting channels for um, protected disclosures uh, by December of, of 2023. And if you have more than 250 employees, you must have your internal reporting channels up and running from the publication of the Act. So again, that's going to be dependent on uh, the audience this afternoon. You will know which grouping you fall into. If you are in the 250 range, then you really need to be taking swift action to amend uh, your protected disclosure policies. Um, so some of the asks again in this new amending legislation is when an organization receives a protected disclosure, they have to acknowledge receipt of it within seven days. So that's quite a short period of time. Um, the reporting channels that I referenced on the previous slide are intended to drive within the organization that there is nominated department or indeed person uh, in respect of the receiving in of protected disclosures. So again, we see diligent follow-up in relation to the protected disclosure feedback on what's going to happen next and definitely feedback within a three months of the receipt of the initial assessment. And uh, finally then um, communicating to the whistleblower the final outcome of any investigation that their protected disclosure uh, triggered. Other um, important updates in relation to this uh, amending protected disclosure legislation is another area that has grown in terms of the reach of accountability is the definition of penalization. So there's a whole range of characteristics that have been identified within the act and just picking on some of them, uh, 
it would be it would be deemed to equate with penalization if somebody made a protected disclosure and they found that as a consequence they had a promotion withheld or they got a negative performance rating or they were suspended or some other reasonable benefit that was objectively within their expectation was denied to them. Very importantly is the burden of proof in relation to penalization. So the way the amending legislation is presented is that the burden of proof sits, sits or rests with an employer. So it's up to the employer to discharge this um, presumption that they have penalized the employee. And we also see that there are um, criminal elements introduced to the sanctions under the legislation. So in terms of failing to operate the internal reporting channels or having acted in a manner that equates with penalization, for example, the legislation contemplates fines from 75,000 to 250,000 and or imprisonment of up to two years. So quite a um, significant sanction uh, monetarily and indeed in terms of the, the criminal uh, end of the matter uh, that employers would be facing if they were to ignore uh, or be uncompliant uh, with the amending legislation. <clears throat> so again, have a look in terms of the numbers in your organization to determine, is this something that you need to be taking action upon now? Or are you in the grouping that the effective compliance date is December 2023? Uh, other in important developments in terms of um, the world of work and um, new legislation that will be coming down the track is the Work-Life Balance and Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. And this, as the title suggests, objective is to achieve better work-life balance for parents and carers. So they clearly are a big cohort of the personnel in our organizations. And the parents and carers under this proposed legislation, so it's only a bill at the moment, will have a right to request flexible working arrangements for, for a set period of time in relation to caring requirements. And the uh, application or the relevant group to which caring would apply would be children of those parents up to the age of 12 or 16 if there is a long-term illness or disability and indeed employees with caring responsibilities. So that could be something like a vulnerable dependent uh, parent of the employee. So the bill is contemplating unpaid leave in the amount of five days per year, where for reasons that are objectively verified, the employee is required to provide this care or support for their family members. Now, this bill is also contemplating extending the period from 26 weeks to 104 weeks following the birth of a child to provide entitlement to paid time off from work or reduction of working hours for breastfeeding purposes. So that's another um, niche area that this bill is contemplating. And also, um, given the um, significant rise in COVID of incidences of domestic violence, I think that is something that has come onto the radar and there will be, uh, when the bill is enacted, there will be a right to five days per year of paid leave for victims of domestic violence. So again, that's a new development that's being contemplated in relation to this uh, piece of uh, legislation around work-life balance. And one that's very topical, uh, and indeed the government were looking to um, come back to the legislators, and I think they may have done so today, in relation to a bill that they want to enact immediately 
around the right to request remote working. So sometimes this is uh, misconstrued as the right to remote working. This will be a right to request remote working. And you can see that there are a number of um, requirements in relation to accessing an application for a right to request remote working. As I say, the grounds for refusal are uh, were contentious and have gone back to the relevant committees who are charged with progressing this bill uh, for revisions. I think the view was expressed very loudly and clearly that there was too much um, uh, objective reason given to employers to refuse uh, an application for remote working. Again, we see there's an appeal to the WRC and indeed there are anti-penalisation provisions. Uh, on the horizon also is the Directive on Transparent and Predictable Working Conditions. So um, this will be uh, important in particularly for those of you involved as line managers and or in recruitment because there will be a limitation now of six months and it will be proportionate for fixed term contracts in respect of probationary periods. Um, any extension to the six months must only be consequent on the relevant worker being on some form of leave. So we have clearly historically had in many organisations probationary periods that might have been up to 11 months. And that's clearly not going to be sustainable going forward when this directive is um, introduced in Ireland. Uh, there's also a provision in the directive that an employer cannot prevent an employee from working with another employer. Now, there may obviously be commercial and other limitations that are um, provided for in the final piece of legislation. And then this, um, I suppose, zero hours it might have been referred to as or unpredictable work patterns. So... The directive is um, determining that workers cannot be required to work unless they have information in relation to an advance information in relation to when, for how long, etc. And they'd have to be compensated if work is cancelled without reasonable notice. And they can request that there will be more predictable and indeed secure uh, working uh, arrangements. And uh, also we've been talking about the reform of the state pension. So uh, presently it looks like maintaining the state pension at 66 and introducing a new flexible pension age model. And that is looking presently at an option, but it's one that is elective for workers to continue working up to the age of 70. And in, in return for that, they would access a higher pension. Um, there's also the move to a fully to uh, sorry there's the move fully to a total contribution approach for individual pensions and there's also the enhanced state pension mooted for provision for long-term carers to be introduced so again waiting out in the long grass uh, to see uh, whether these pension reforms will uh, uh, ultimately uh, come to pass so that concludes my whistle stop tour, um, Kevin, uh, around the issues that are, uh, I suppose, on the minds of employers in late uh, October 2022. Um, hopefully, you will have found the webinar helpful in signposting. Uh, your awareness, firstly, and or your need to address in a practical way, the provisions uh, of the various statutory asks or the codes of practice. And all of that, of course, levels up to a, <clears throat> a much more transparent uh, work environment, which generally helps to keep workers happier, which adds to the workers' positive um, impression of their existing 
place of work and can act as a significant factor in the the weighing decision that workers are making in terms of should I stay or should I go and clearly you know the other variables around pay and uh how people are expected to carry out their work are going to be much more locally determined and indeed individually determined by different uh, participants in the webinar today. But they are clearly exercising both employers and uh, employees. And there is a lot of movement, um, upward movement in terms of um, competent, attractive professional workers uh, it is a good time for those persons to move to a better space. So I think employers just need to be very aware that they're in this very competitive space and perhaps the contents of today might help them to address some of those issues locally. Katie, thank you so much. Um, really insightful and and really relevant and 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 you know in the moment now. So uh, really, really thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, Tina had actually um, answered one or two questions already that people had had. So I I just wanted to highlight there is one, um, and it says uh, it's from Phil. It says Ori the gender the gender gap the employee thresh thresholds refer to FTEs? That's the question. Full-time equivalents. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I suppose they're asking the question, um, I'm guessing, does the employee thresh threshold re refer to full-time equivalents for, for the gender pay gap? Um, I prefer to come back to that particular uh, participant, maybe with um, some detail on that question, if it could be passed on to us. Yeah. Yeah, because I think um, it's quite a complex piece of legislation. And I know that, um, you know, it, it is um, important clearly for employers to get their reporting right from the outset, because it's something that you're going to be linking back to in a comparative way. Um, that's the way the gender pay gap reporting work. So if that could be sent on to us, um, we'd be happy to uh, reply to that particular person. And indeed that answer can be made available to people generally. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah, and as Katie mentioned, if there are any other further questions, because um, we were speaking beforehand that sometimes when you, you take a lot of this information in, you might go back to, to, to your work and in a day or two, you might have more additional questions. So please do feel free to pass them on to ourselves and we'll make sure to, to, to collate them um, and send them on to, to uh, Tina and Katie and uh, get a response for you then. So uh, do feel free to do that. Um, so if there's anything else, uh, I don't see any more, uh, questions, um, the, sorry, Marion, uh, the link is not working as the entered values cannot be saved. Do you see, the, see the fields below for details? Um, and there was another question just around, is it possible to subscribe to Adair HR's newsletter? Um, Tina's going to answer that for you now. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think, listen, we'll we'll collate these and um, hopefully be able to come back to you. And Tina, if you want to um, to, to do that, um, and you'll see the chat from, from Tina as well around our next event, which we will be advertising as well, hopefully um, uh, later, later in the year. Um, and as I said, the recording will be made available as well for everyone. Um, and we'll be sending it to some people, unfortunately, who, who really wanted to be here but couldn't get here today. So um, mm -hmm. we will make sure for that. So, Katie, if there's anything else from you that you wanted to, to say. No, just to thank people for taking, as I said, the time out. I know people are very busy. I hope they will feel that uh, they, um, it, they're going to get a return on their investment in terms of the information now that they have. Uh, and that they can um, act on personally or indeed whatever is appropriate, bring back to their organization. Because there is a lot of um, pace 
in the workplace presently, particularly around um, employment law uh, provisions. Um, and um, it is sometimes difficult to keep up or to differentiate uh, between the different kinds of leave. It's all a good thing, of course, that uh, workers are getting um, additional rights um, but um, happy to uh, take any queries or clarifications or uh, in relation to what we spoke about today, uh, but really just to thank people for um, joining us in your uh, webinar this morning. Brilliant, Katie. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And just to finally say just that, that Tina has responded. So you, there is a link there in the chat if you want to, to, to click on that for to, to sign up to the newsletter. And also she's put in the, the info email address um, for, for Adair as well, uh, if you want to get directly in touch. Um, so again, and people can come directly to myself as well. Okay, well, listen, thank you so much, everybody. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you to, to our next event soon. All Thanks the best. very much. Bye, everyone.